In this lesson, we'll cover perception. Your perception is your interpretation of sensory impulses that you receive. So you experience different sensations. You see things, you hear things, you smell things, taste things, etc. And those impulses travel to your brain and you interpret them. In order to interpret or perceive an image, it has to stand out from its background. This is known as figure ground. For example, if I painted a person the same color as my back wall and stood you back there, you wouldn't be detected because you're not different from the background. So in other words, if you're looking at uh, the black images on the right picture, okay, you're perceiving birds, but if you look at the background and then you focus on the white, then you would be perceiving fish. So that's figure ground. Whenever we perceive something at first, we take in the whole picture. And it's like a defense mechanism. It kind of warns us if there'd be any danger. So we take in the big picture first, and then we start to break down details. And this is known as gestalt. Anytime you see the word whole, you're going to associate that with gestalt. For example, if you look at the picture on the right, at first, the horses and the man in the forest scene jumps out at you. But after you look closer, your mind will break down the details in the background and you'll start to see face images throughout the picture. So in this slide, if you read what's in the triangle, I'll give you a second. Most of you probably read Paris in the spring because your mind just takes in the whole big picture and it doesn't make sense that this actually says Paris in the, the spring. Your mind just kind of tunes that out. That's another example of gestalt in a principle called closure. We tend to just fill in the gaps and our mind didn't see the, the, because it doesn't make sense to us. A few gestalt principles or grouping principles I have listed here. Uh, first of all, proximity. So proximity, we tend to group figures that are nearby, close to one another. So if you look at the lines, instead of seeing six distinct lines, you see three parallel lines because of the proximity that they're located. Similarity, we tend to group figures that are similar. So if you look at the picture in the middle, we group the blue faces together because they're similar and the pink faces because they are similar. So we group them separately. Continuity, that's the image on the left. We tend to perceive images as continuous and, and ever going. And finally, closure. Um, if you look at the picture at the bottom right, your mind will perceive a triangle because you're just filling in the gaps, even though a triangle is not drawn there. So that's a good example of closure. So your depth perception is the ability to recognize depth or distance, to recognize how far something is away from you. Um, in this unit, they look at when depth perception develops in children. We know that animals, as soon as they're born and can move around, they have depth perception. If they got to the edge of a cliff, they would not just walk off of it. Of course, you can't test a child and just put them on the edge of a cliff to see if they will fall off. However, two researchers, uh, Gibson and Walk, uh, had their young child at the Grand Canyon, and they asked that question. I wonder if a young child would just, because there's no railings there, which is crazy, um, would a young child just crawl off of the side of the Grand Canyon, or do we have depth perception after we can crawl? So they developed a test, um, as you can see here with the table. So they have a glass tabletop, and then they have a tablecloth that goes down on the floor and then up underneath half of the table is a solid table, which they put the tablecloth on. So if you look at this, um, a baby, the, the parent stands on the other side of the table that's clear and tries to encourage the child to crawl across that. Now we know if a child crosses that, they lack depth perception. And what they found was most children, when placed on that side of the table, which appears to be on a solid surface, when encouraged to crawl over, would not. 
In fact, many of them were trying to put their foot down, thinking that they're going down off of the table and would be hitting the glass and seemed very confused. Uh, but we do find that uh, most children, once they can crawl, they do have depth perception. So when looking at something, we have binocular cues because we see with two eyes and trying to judge depth and distance. And one of the binocular cues is retinal disparity. So as, your, as an object comes within about, let's say, a foot away from your eyes, there's a gap in our vision because your eyes are at slightly different angles. And so they take in information from each eye at different angles and they go to your brain for processing in 3D. And that's the same principle behind a 3D movie. When they film for a 3D movie, they set cameras up at the same angles as your eyes. And then you put on the glasses to make up for the disparity there and see things in 3D. And you can see this gap in your vision if you put your two fingers straight out in front of your straight out in front of your face with a slight gap between them, maybe a couple inches, right at eye level. And then you look over top of your fingers, you will see like a little floating sausage finger like you see here in the picture. So that's retinal disparity. Another binocular cue, as things start to approach towards us, our eyes move inward. And that sends a signal to our brain, hey, back up, things are getting too close. We can also see depth and distance with just one eye, and that would be a monocular uh, depth cue. And an artist can capture this very well. If you make train tracks, they look like they're going to converge in the distance. Okay, so that's linear perspective anytime you have parallel lines. Um, but we know the further away something gets, the smaller it gets too. So that's relative size. So if you look at the object, um, the little trucks, okay, the, the small truck looks further away from us because in real life, things that are smaller are further away. The closer you are to something, the larger it appears. Another monocular cue is called interposition. Closer objects block more distant objects in real life. So the blue circle looks closer to us than the red, just by making that look like it's behind, the red behind the blue, the blue appears closer. Two last monocular cues. First of all, relative shadow or relative clarity. They mean the same thing. If you look at this picture, things that are clear are usually closer. If they're shaded, they're further away. And we can capture that in, in drawings as well. And you, need, you only need one eye to see that. Um, also relative motion. Things that are closer to us appear to be moving faster. So a car that would be driving past Mountain Ridge would appear to be going faster than if I was coming in for a landing on an airplane, you look down, it appears like things are just simply crawling. So the further away something is, the slower it appears to be moving. Another concept here, the phi phenomenon. Um, this is an illusion that we, we perceive movement when we see adjacent lights blinking on and off. So if you've ever seen like an arrow on a marquee, just by making those lights blink at different times, it appears to be moving down the arrow. With this concept, perceptual constancy, um, sometimes we perceive things as unchanging, even if that retinal image changes. Okay, so there are three examples. First of all, let's do the shape because that's the picture I have up there. So shape constancy. Okay, this is a door, obviously it's a rectangle. But when you open the door, you still perceive it as a rectangle, even though the image has changed now on your retina. You don't look at it and say, oh, wow, that's a trapezoid. No, we still perceive it as a rectangle. Uh, color or brightness constancy. Whenever you're in dimly lit areas, you can only see in black, whites, and shades of gray. Uh, because when in, in very dimly lit areas, your rods are activated, but not your cones. Your cones allow you to see color. But if you are in a downtown city area and there's very little light and you look at a brick wall, you'll perceive it as red. 
even though your cones are not activated, in your mind, you know it's red and that's how you'll perceive it. So that's color constancy. Um, size constancy, as things move further away, we still recognize that their actual form. For example, a student sitting here in front of me in my classroom looks a lot larger than when I see them over in the parking lot at McDonald's, but I don't look over and say, wow, they've turned into a midget because the, the image is so small. I still recognize them as people size. So that's size constancy. So I mentioned before that sensation is all of the sensory impulses that come in. So everything you see here, taste, touch, and smell. So this chapter was about sensation and perception. And sensation is all of the sensory input. So everything that comes in through your senses, all of the impulses you receive. Um, so it's everything you see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. Now, those sensory impulses travel up to your brain and you interpret them. So sensation is also called bottom up because things are traveling from the outside world up. And perception is referred to as top down because now you interpret them and then you respond as, as a result of that interpretation. So let's say you're riding down the road and you hear a song and you, those impulses come in through your ears, they travel up to your brain and you interpret it. You either like the song and then you may turn it up or you don't like the song and you may change the station. So that is your perception, your interpretation of those impulses. So we all interpret impulses very differently. Our perception is very different from one another. And that's because of our background things that we've experienced. And that's known as your perceptual set. So your background, things that have occurred in your life will cause you to perceive something very different from someone else. We can all perceive or sense the same sensory impulses, but interpret them very differently. So for example, um, if you watched a television show, you may have thought, wow, you inter interpret that. You really like that. I, I love The Office. So I watch The Office and I really like it. Whereas other people, they watch the same show, but they don't really care for it. They've interpreted it very different. And it's based on your background and, and things that you've encountered uh, growing up. I bought tickets to go see Les Mis uh, for my husband and I one day. And he fell asleep. And I was like, are you kidding me? These tickets are expensive. And he had never been to the theater before. I had been raised going to Broadway. So I saw the same thing that he did, but I really enjoyed it and him not so much. Um, if I have students in my class from uh, other countries, a foreign exchange student, and they see these videos here or these uh, images here, if I say, what's that picture in the middle? They're like, I don't know. Now, we have experience, you know, that's a background, a perceptual set, knowing that that's supposed to be a picture of Bigfoot. To the right, that's supposed to be the Loch Ness Monster. So many people who have never seen these images before have no perceptual set of that. Here's another example of your perceptual set. Most of you, even though this image is distorted, can look at it and say, oh, that's Abraham Lincoln, because you've seen this picture of him before. But here again, people in other countries would not have that background, that perceptual set, and wouldn't have any idea who this is. Whenever we perceive something, the background or context matters. Okay, so for example, if you look at these two basketball players, uh, Sun Ming Ming, 7'9", and Randy Gill, 6'2". Okay, so here in this picture, Randy Gill looks short, but if you put him beside me, he'll look tall because it's in a different context or background. When looking at vision, um, we have the ability to adjust to a distorted visual field. Okay, for example, somebody with cataracts, they would have spots on their eyes and it would cause them not to be able to see depth or distance like we do. But over time, they will adjust and they're able to accommodate 
for that distortion. So that is perceptual adaptation.